Hey everyone. So we just spent some time looking at the um, Herbert Hoover speech from 1932. Um, really his criticism of the New Deal while he was running against uh, Franklin Roosevelt for the presidency. Um, so now we're going to look at a, a speech from Franklin Roosevelt uh, in 1936. So four years later, I hate to ruin it for you, Hoover didn't get reelected. Uh, Roosevelt won. And this is a speech four years into the New Deal. Um, and him describing, really, I mean, I guess you could say the justification for it um, and uh, why it's necessary. So make sure you got something to write with. Again, we're going to be using the uh, excerpts from the American Yacht, um, and so it'll be on your screen. But make sure you've got something to record your thoughts with as you go. Let's get to it. Hey guys, uh, we're taking a look at Franklin Roosevelt's uh, re-nomination speech, um, acceptance speech from 1936. Um, we'll get a little bit of details in the initial introduction to just so we know what a renomination speech is. Remember, we looked at Hoover earlier. Let's make sure I'm in red. Um, remember, Hoover was in 32, so now we're uh, four years in the future. So really what you're looking at is four years of the New Deal by this point, or four years of FDR's administration. He's now been president for four years. Okay. So, Franklin Roosevelt's renomination speech, 1936. In July 27, 1936, President Franklin Roosevelt accepted his renomination as the Democratic Party's presidential choice. In his acceptance speech, Roosevelt laid out his understandings of what freedom and tyranny meant in an industrial society. Um, so, a couple things. So, he's not, he's not been reelected yet, but the Democrats have renominated him to. Uh, to run for president, that shouldn't be surprising because he already is president and that always happens. But um, it is important to note that FDR ends up getting nominated four times. Um, uh, so this is two of four, we'll say that. Um, and so he's talking about what freedom and tyranny means. You know, we use these words all the time. What is freedom? What is tyranny? Um, and what Roosevelt's specifically looking at is... Uh, in an industrial democracy. So maybe you'd say like, another way to say that would be in a modern democracy. What does freedom and tyranny actually mean? All right, so here we go. These are his words, starting now. Philadelphia is a good city in which to write American history. This is fitting ground on which to reaffirm the faith of our fathers, to pledge ourselves to restore to the people a wider freedom to give to 1936 as the founders gave to 1776, an American way of life. So you guys know this. This is when we declared our independence. If you just watched the Hoover video, it'll be really interesting because Hoover kept talking about how our way of life was disappearing. But here we have FDR saying um, that basically what he's doing or what he has done is reaffirmed the faith of our fathers. So this is a, um, this is a good lesson that Everyone always tries to align with the Founding Fathers. So what you have is two guys on different sides of the spectrum. Both of them are saying, hey, we're like Hoover's saying, we're losing something if we go FDR's way. FDR's saying, no, we're aligning with the Fathers. It's because everybody wants to align with the Washingtons and Hamiltons and Jeffersons. That's just, a lot of times that is kind of like a political speech. Not always, but a lot of times. That very word freedom, remember this is what his purpose is, this is what he's telling us, this and tyranny, in itself and of necessity suggests freedom from some restraining power. In 1776, we sought freedom from the tyranny of a political autocracy. So freedom from tyranny, basically British rule that left no, uh, no room for individual liberty, I guess is how you might say that. from the 18th century royalists who held special privileges from the crown. It was to perpetuate their privilege that they governed without the consent of the governed. Really, that's what democracy is, um, is that the people have a voice. Anytime you see that phrase, people have a voice. So that's what the revolution was about, was that people needed a voice in how they were governed that they denied the right of free assembly and free speech, and that they restricted the worship of God. This is kind of an interesting thing. We're not going to get into it, but there is a, 
an interesting take on um, on this that we could talk about, where the British uh, policy on religion contributed to uh, the revolution. Um, that's a whole different thing, but it is interesting that FDR brings it up here. That they put the average man's property and the average, lives, average man's life in pawn to the mercenaries of dynastic power and that they regimented the people. Basically, what you're seeing here is there is no freedom. You know, there's no freedom of assembly, or at least uh, in, before the revolution. No, uh, no freedom of assembly, no freedom of religion, no freedom of speech. Uh, your property wasn't even free. You, uh, you were pawns to the mercenaries of dynastic power. If you, if you think about the Bill of Rights and those first 10 amendments that get added to the Constitution, most of them address these things that FDR is talking about here. So that's a, that's a take on the revolution. Remember, this is all about uh, the legacy of the Founding Fathers. What does it mean to be American? Well, he's given us this paragraph to be like, hey, this is why people initially rebelled. And so it was to win freedom from the tyranny of political autocracy that the American Revolution was fought. The victory, uh, the victory gave the business of governing into the hands of the average man who won the right with his neighbors to make and order his own destiny through his own government. Political tyranny was wiped out at, July, uh, at Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776. Those are strong words. There is no more tyranny, or it was destroyed. Um, the other interesting thing is up here that he talks about victory uh, gave the business of governing into the hands of the average man. So uh, the uh, average American now has a say in how um, the government functions and that tyranny is wiped out. Really, you're saying this is where almost like freedom for the individual is established. I guess I can say it that way. Since that struggle, however, man's inventive genius released new forces in our land which reordered the lives of our people. The age of machinery, of railroads, of steam and electricity, the telegraph and the radio, mass production, mass distribution, all of these combined to bring for forward a new civilization and with it a new problem for those who sought to remain free. Remember, he talked about industrialized democracy. Right? Like we've entered a new phase because the, the world technologically that the founders lived in is different from the one that FDR is inhabiting in the 1930s. For out of this modern civilization, economic royalists carve new dynasties. So what he's doing here is he's tying... So hopefully you can read my um, handwriting. Business... Uh, not businessmen necessarily, but like uh, business moguls back to British royalists. So maybe you'd think about like the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and all these uh, businessmen, the J.P. Morgans who'd gotten uh, famous um, and powerful through uh, private business um, what he's saying is they're kind of like the British royalists that had a say that didn't let the average man have a say in government. They carved new dynasties. New kingdoms were built upon concentration of control over material things. Kingdoms. Look at this. Think. Britain. He's trying to make that connection. That the founders rebelled against uh, royalists and kings. And what are we talking about here? The average man up against kingdoms and royalists. But in this case, it's uh, business moguls, businessmen, big business. Through new use of corporations, banks, and securities, new machinery of industry and agriculture, of labor and capital, all undreamed of by the fathers, the whole structure of modern life was impressed into this royal service. Royal service. This is really interesting. I hope you guys are catching that. There was no place among this royalty for our many thousands of small businessmen and merchants who sought to make a worthy use of the American system of initiative and profit. Initiative, remember Hoover talked about that too. They were no more free than the worker or the farmer. Even honest and progressive-minded men of wealth, aware of their obligation to their generation, could never know just where they fitted into this dynastic scheme of things. So when you see dynastic, what he's talking about like... Um, 
wealth that persists. So what we're talking about in the same way you would have talked about in England, if you talked about um, the, the political power that just stayed with the king or stayed with parliament, really what FDR is talking about is, is wealth that does the same thing. You know, that, um, that business accumulates this wealth um, and the average man doesn't know how to fit into it, even the small, smaller businessmen. All right. It was natural and perhaps human that the privileged princes of the princes of these new economic dynasties, thirsting for power, reached out for control over government itself. They created a new despotism and wrapped it in the robes of legal sanctions. So basically, business power seized political power. You could say, how'd they do that? Well, that would be like, maybe it's through lobbying, which is like giving money to elected officials. It could be through getting elected themselves. You know, there are a variety of ways that that happens, but basically what he's saying is all these people that made big, big money in business then reached out and took control of the government. And they created new despotism and wrapped it in the robes of legal sanction. They made it look nice and pretty. Remember, this is FDR's words. In its service, new mercenaries sought to regiment the people, their labor and their property. Essentially, this is like, you know, going back to the revolution. And now all of a sudden the people are regimented or ordered around by the government, by business, um, and they're no longer free in the way that we understood it back uh, with the revolution. And as a result, the average man once more confronts the problem that faced the Minutemen. So what he did is he just took us on a really roundabout uh, route to say um, modern, remember this is 1936, average man is like the Minuteman from the revolution. An old English judge once said, Necessitous men are not free men. Liberty requires opportunity to make a living, a living decent according to the standard of the time, a living in which man not only gives man not only enough to live by, but something to live for. So this is what's necessary for free, free men. And to be a free man is that you have something to live for, not just what to live by. That's FDR is kind of using that as his definition of what it means to be free. For too many of us, the political equality we once had was meaningless in the face of economic inequality. A small group had concentrated into their hands an almost complete control over other people's property, other people's money, other people's labor, and other people's lives. For too many of us, life was no longer free, liberty no longer real, men could no longer follow the pursuit of happiness. Remember, that's a call back to the Declaration of Independence too. Against economic tyranny such as this, the American citizen could appeal only to the organized power of government. The collapse of 1929 showed up the despotism for what it was. The election of 1932 was the people's mandate to end it. What, what's that mean to say the people's mandate? Almost like saying the people's order. So by him getting elected, the people said we need to end this uh, economic despotism or political despotism, whatever. All right, we're winding it up here. Today we stand committed to the proposition that freedom is no half and half affair. If the average citizen is guaranteed equal opportunity in the polling place, he must have equal opportunity in the marketplace. So he's saying equality is not just uh, political, but economic. These economic royalists complain, remember, tie back to the British, that we seek to overthrow the institutions of America. Hey, that's just what Hoover said. Remember that? <laughs> what they really complain of is that we seek to take away their power. Our allegiance to American institution requires the overthrow of this kind of power. In vain, they seek to hide behind the flag and the Constitution. In their blindness, they forget what the flag and Constitution stand for. Now, as always, they stand for democracy, not tyranny. 
for freedom, not subjection, and against a dictatorship by mob rule and the overprivileged alike. Governments can err. Presidents do make mistakes, but the immortal Dante tells us that divine justice weighs the sins of the cold-blooded and the same sins of the warm-hearted in different scales. That's really interesting. Basically, what's the difference between warm-hearted and cold-blooded is warm-hearted has good intentions. So essentially, this feels like we might make mistakes, mistakes, but we're doing it for good reasons. Better the occasional faults of a government that lives in a spirit of charity than the consistent omission of a government frozen, look at the connection there, cold-blooded, um, frozen in the ice of its own indifference. There is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. The gener this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. It's really interesting when you look at Great Depression, World War II, and this is kind of a prescient uh, thing. Um, and I think it is. it does kind of tie a little bit together with Hoover, that there are going to be demands on this generation. Okay, so let's sum it up. We'll go out here and say, um, to put it in brief terms, um, equality can't just be political. It needs to be economic, too. And then average man in 1936 is stuck under a political and economic power much like Minutemen in 1776 and radical change was necessary in the face of modern developments. All right. Thanks for sticking with me, guys.